So uh, we'll start the afternoon session with our first speaker, Peter Coxall. Peter has worked for Voss over the past five years in work health and safety and has performed related roles in Forestry TAS, Civil Construction Corporation and Hazel Brothers. Peter will be outlining learning surrounding the complex issue of contractor management and other challenges in the construction industry. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. Management of subcontractors or roles and responsibilities of subcontractors and head contractors. Roles, responsibilities and or legal obligations when it comes to health and safety on a construction site or more generally at a work site which involves a head contractor or to use terminology from the previous act, a principal and its subcontractors can be quite varied and therefore levels of complexity do exist. Often legal obligations for the head contractor or principal and the subcontractors are not all that well understood. And to be honest, in some cases, we do have some people that quite often distort them. And so it's very difficult, especially for subcontractors, I think, to know exactly what they have to do to be in, com to be in legal compliance. So what I propose to do today is discuss what I believe, based on legal advice that I've received from in-house counsel at Forestry over some years, but also re re um, recently confirmed by a well-known practitioner at uh, Page Seeger. What I propose is to outline the obligations for both head contractors and for subcontractors, and how therefore different organisations can meet their obligations or duties. And the way I've done it is I'm actually going to refer to some legal cases that have happened over the past five to six years, one very recently earlier this year. But first, I want to dispel a myth. In my personal experience over some years, there's been a body of opinion that says that the head contractor is always always, at least in part, or entirely responsible for any health or safety breach or adverse safety outcome at a work site where there is a head contractor and subcontractors. Now, this body of opinion has come from a number of places. Other self health and safety professionals have said it to me um, over years, said, if you're the head contractor, you're in charge of the site. You're it, full stop. This opinion also has come from some members of the inspectorate that I've known over the years. Certainly some unions have got this view and have had that view, had this view. But perhaps more interestingly, and this is perhaps more opinion than fact, it appears to have come from some of the courts in different jurisdictions. And the first case that I'm gonna talk about is one of those until it got to the High Court. Now, the first case I'm going to talk about happened in Victoria. Now, I've unashamedly um, plagiarised some very basic graphics from Paige Seeger um, presentation fairly recently. But BIEDA is probably reasonably well known by some, um, but it really, in my view, was a, a landmark decision um, which advises who has responsibility and when. So I'll go through the case briefly with you. Now, we have four players. We have Baeda, who is a chicken, he's actually a chicken processor. And they subcontracted works to three others, chick, a chicken farmer, Halbin, a chicken catcher, DM, DM uh, Poltec, and as a party, Haulage. Now, the case, goes like this. Bayada Pol Poultry, Proprietary Limited, a broiler chicken processing business, engaged independent contractors, DMP Poltec and as a party haulage, to round up and pack chickens into crates and transport the crates to a processing plant, which Bayada operated. Now this goes back to 2005 and it's in Victoria. 
But during the operation on the 4th of December 2005, an unlicensed DMP forklift driver used a forklift to load steel pallets carrying the crates onto the trailer. The DMP employee asked the director of As a Party to help shift the steel pallets to even up the load. And as this was being done, one of the steel pallets and fell and killed the, the director of As a Party. So we have a fatality. Baeda was charged with breaching section 21 of the OHS Act in Victoria by failing to provide and maintain so far as reasonably practicable a safe work environment. Baeda pleaded not guilty, arguing that it did not have the right to control how the forklift was being used because the forklift was in the control of DMP and that Baeda was entitled to rely on DMP as a competent and experienced contractor to carry out the work that Baeda could not do itself. Now, the trial judge rejected Baeda's argument and fined them $100,000. Now, Baeda appealed through the courts and each time the appeal was dismissed until it got the high, to the High Court. And amongst other things, the High Court did say, yes, it was entitled to rely on the expertise of the transport subcontractor. And it sort of makes sense in a way. I mean, Beta is a chicken producer, a chicken processor. How does it fully know the full ins and outs of health and safety in the transport industry? So this was a landmark decision, as I say, and what the High Court then did was actually gave some clarity around um, what reasonably practicable might mean. And it says the High Court's decision in Bayer confirms that control of the activity is a necessary element in the consideration of what is reasonably practicable to do. It also confirms that in some circumstances, a duty to do what is reasonably practicable can be discharged or met, if you like, by engaging specialist contractors. If Baeda was in the transport business or had expertise in the transport business, it would have done it itself. But it, was, but it contracted it out because it didn't have that expertise. Also went on to say that um, engaging specialist contractors and the duty can also be met even if the duty holder, or Baeda in this case, has not taken every possible step that it was capable of taking. So it's not always the head contractor that is responsible in some of these cases. Second case is in Tasmania. And it happened here. And the decision was handed down earlier this year. This is the full decision. But I want to read you some of the points because they're very similar to what is in the Bayida case. So this, this particular case is based on the new laws because it happened on 29th of January in 2013. And on that date, a worker who was employed as an excavator driver at the Macrobies Gully tip site died when a universal beam, which was being lifted by an excavator, fell from a sling and struck him. At the time, the excavator was being used to lift the beam and to place it in the ground when the sling broke. Now, the head contractor in this particular case back in 2013 was Hutchinson's Builders. And our authorities here decided to prosecute Hutchinson's. On the particular day, there was no Hutchinson's um, worker or employee on site. After the, after the tr trial went through, this was some of the summing up of the magistrate. He said, after weighing up all the facts as found in this prosecution, I am not satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant, Hutchinson's, failed as far as reasonably practicable to provide safe systems at work at the Macrobies Gully tip site necessary to protect the deceased. He went on to say, in reaching this conclusion, I found 
into account all matters, but in particular the following, that Hutchinson's had some subcontracted nearly all construction duties, including pile driving activities to a subcontractor, who in turn had subcontracted the pile driving duties to another expert in the area of pile driving. And that it was reasonable for the defendant to leave the precise method that the, the piles were to be driven to these experts. And that it was entitled to rely upon that subcontractor's experience to ensure that the equipment did, did not fail. It was entitled, having chosen competent operators and approved its choice of subcontractor, to rely on the expertise of these subcontractors, particularly where the work was not within the defendant's expertise or Hutchinson's expertise. He found that the, L, the beam fell as a result of equipment failure and struck the deceased who was in an, in the, in an exclusion zone. That, the, that Hutchinson's had no control over the equipment used, meaning the sling and the ex, or the exclusion zone, and it was reasonable that it did not have that control. Hutchinson's had in place a chain of command. It had in place an induction system. The head subcontractor who was working under Hutchinson's, which was responsible for nearly all work on site, had a site supervisor on site throughout the operations who was aware of the method of pile driving being used on the day and approved of that method. The, the, the head subcontractor was an experienced operator and any problems it perceived could have been notified but was not to Hutchinson's. Let, Hutchinson's were not, not let know. But Hutchinson's had in place a very good communication and consultation process, including the use of mobile phones. It was possible for Hutchinson's site supervisor to be contacted by any, at any time if there are any difficulties or perceived problems with the method that's adopted on the site. It was open to any subcontractor if they considered any work to be dangerous or substandard to immediately stop work. The fact that work was not stopped or complained of by the subcontractors strongly su suggests that nobody saw any danger or inadequate work. There existed a formal pr procedure of pre-work site meetings and toolbox meetings in which the potential problems and work methods could be discussed. There is no expert evidence that the systems adopted by Hutchinson's were not systems generally adopted in the building industry or that it departed from an industry standard or systems. So it's important to understand that it's not always the head contractor in those situations, but they, they, the head contractor still does have a duty. And it's generally outlined in section 19 of the Act. But just going back over the case again, on site, site manager for head contractor was not on site on the day of the incident, however, had in place robust induction process communication and consultation processes, pre-start and toolbox meetings, and could have been contacted if any concerns about the pile driving. I understand they also had monitoring and measurements, so site inspections around the site periodically, just to, based on their knowledge to see if there was any non-compliance with codes, standards, etc. And Hutchinson's were entitled to rely on the expertise of the subcontractor in, to ensure a safe workplace. So what are our obligations? Well, the reality is that the obligations under the Act are exactly the same in general for a head contractor and a subcontractor. And they're outlined in this section. Now, I've only put um, part one of section 19 at the moment. And that is to ensure that workers engaged are safe at work in general. And the sections 25 through to 26 describe other duties in relation to plant and structures. And section 20 describes additional duties for the management control of the work site, which Hutchinson's would have had in this situation. So how, do, how does each party ensure safe workplaces? There's some guidance further into in this section, which is um, part three of this section, which I'll go into shortly, which gives a bit of guidance. But in general, I'll start with the head contractor. What are they required to do to ensure that all workers on the site, as far as reasonably practicable, for their knowledge of the, the type of work that's happening, how can they, what should they be doing? Well, 
I got some advice probably over 10 years ago um, from, as I was talking about before, the general counsel at Forestry where I was. And he said to me, one of the biggest issues that you've got to do before you engage a subcontractor in the first instance is to check that they are fit, capable and competent to do the work. And the level of detail a head contractor needs to go into depends on the set of circumstances. Um, if I'm, there is apparently case law on if, if you're talking about a homeowner as opposed to a, you know, a large construction company, engaging um, a plumber or an electrician at their home. And really the only thing that they needed to do in terms of what was reasonably practicable in that situation is to look in the phone book to see if they're, a license, if they're licensed. A large construction company such as Voss, Hutchinson's, Fairbrother, et cetera, really need to go into far more detail. So we're looking at, so if you're a subcontractor, often you'll be asked to fill in an application form. And it'll ask for things like references. Have you done the work before? Can anybody refer you on and say how, how well you've done your work? Have you got your appropriate insurances in place? And of course, like with the homeowner, appropriate licensing if you're somebody like an electrician or, a, or a, a plumbing contractor. But in, in the area that I work, one of the things that we like to see, regardless of whether you're, you are a small family subcontractor with perhaps one or two employees or a, or a larger one, is to have a safety management system in place. And generally, if you've got a safety management system in place, you probably go, if you've got that, some processes, these will probably enable you to comply with the law. And I'll go through them. In my view, these are the minimum things that you should have in a safety management system. You don't have to have procedures necessarily, but you've got a way, a way of doing this. Now, I think you should have a health and safety policy document. I'm not going to die in a ditch if you don't, because I just think that one's a good thing to have. It, it, it states the commitment of the organisation. I've seen a lot of you know, very generic safety, safety policies before, and I would encourage you, not, try not to do that, but you can have some generic statements, but try and include something about your own organisation in your policy statement. You absolutely should have a, a hazard identification, risk assessment and control of risk process in your, in your safety management system. Now, for all intents and purposes, JSAs, safe work method statements, JRAs or job risk assessments are exactly the same thing. What you're doing is identifying the work you do in order identifying the hazards, the things that can hurt you, the risks, what the outcome can be, and what the controls you're going to put in place are based on the hierarchy of controls, obviously engineering, removing from the workplace, which is elimination. Um, people say to me, well, look, hang on a minute, I only have to document one of these if I'm doing high-risk construction work. Well, I want to see you do it for everything because not only does high risk construction work, not only are they the fatality hazards, but in terms of lots of injuries that we see on site, there are things that involve non-high risk construction work. The back, the, uh, the back injuries, the shoulder injuries are quite often nothing to do with high risk construction work. So I want you as a subcontractor to think about what can hurt your people, including those back injuries. And if you've got a documented as part of your safe work method statement or your JSA, then I'm going to be happy. Try to do health and safety inspections in your part of the area that you might be working on one of our uh, one, uh, large contractor's sites. Um, if you've got plant and equipment, you should be doing inspections. If you've decided to... Um, do a whole range of things in terms of height work, I want to see that you've got it at part of your inspections. Generally, the inspections are checking that what you've got in your safe work method statements are in place and actually working. 
And if you do it once a week, I'd be, I'd be very happy. Now, head contractors often do one for the entire site. I think that you should, as a subcontractor, you should be doing it for your own little area where you're working on the site. Induction. You should be inducting any new employees that you have. You should be telling what you reasonably would need to tell them about. What your expectations as a business owner are, um, what are in your safe work method statements that you expect them to follow, um, you should induct them into your workplace. Training and competency register. I, I find this was one of the areas quite often, especially in the forest industry where we had significant, um, I suppose, non-compliance. The requirement is to identify what training and competencies you need in your business, whether you need li licences, competencies, and then ensure that anybody you employ has those or that you train them. But there's another thing, a lot of these licences, et cetera, um, tend to expire. So have you got something to ensure that that ticket is renewed before it expires? So that's a process within your work, in, in your um, system that you, pro you, that you need. Communication and consultation. We're required to do it with all our subcontractors, but you need to do it within your, within your own workforce as well. One of the best examples I saw was on um, a Blunston Arena, quite a, a reasonable sized plumber within the industry. He always had a five, 10 minute pre-start check every day and recorded what he talked about. And they went through their safe work method statement, which took five minutes to say, okay, well today we're actually gonna be putting some pipes on the underneath of this, this particular uh, suspended slab and we're going to be working two and a half metres off the ground. So we're going to be using the boom lift, so you need to check that, um, you need to check the mechanics of it, you need to do your pre-start check, make sure you've got your uh, exclusion zone because we've got some other, other workers over here. And they did it particularly well in my view. So that's another thing that I'm looking for. You've got some sort of communication and consultation process. Incident reporting, if anything happens, what happened, what did you do to fix it? How are you going to prevent a recurrence? Emergency procedures, often on a big construction site, the head contractors set all that up. So often you don't have to worry about it. But you need to know what they are. But sometimes you might be a, a small contractor working on a site where there is no other um, head contractor to manage that, so you'll have to have those in place. What happens if somebody gets hurt? Have you got phone numbers, contacts that can be contacted immediately? Um, have you, if there's a fire where we're working, what do we do? Um, so some, just some very basic procedures for the workers that you're dealing with. And you need to be able to keep these records. You, know where to, you need to know where to put your hands on it. So that's what I'm normally checking as part of an application process. But it gives you guidance about what subcontractors' responsibilities are, which again, as I say, often is the same as what ours is. Because the law doesn't distinguish between a small organisation and a large one. So, our responsibilities, or a, a head contractor has the responsibility to discharge the duty imposed by the Act, a PCBU or a, an employer who has management control of their work site and engages subcontractors to undertake work on the work site to set up um, safe systems of work, which includes, so we have to set up a, a set of um, a system of induction. So any time a worker comes onto the site, we have to tell them about the site. Over there are the toilets. Over there is is where you can have your lunch. Over here, we've got a number of power lines that you need to be aware of, and that's what an induction should include. We need to tell all workers. So this is head contractor's responsibility. Need to set up a management structure on site. Robust communication and consultation process. I saw it done well um, at the Hutchinson site at the Meyer site. Um, every morning at 10 to seven, we had the, guy, the Hutchinson's guy come out and said, today, this is what's happening. We've got this truck coming in here and these guys are gonna be working over there. So everybody sort of knew what they were doing. Um, at our Mac 1 site on the wharf there, 
it's not quite as done as frequently as that, but during their toolbox which, meeting, which they have once a week, they talk about the upcoming weekly events and who's going to be responsible and where you're not to work, etc. A system of monitoring and measurement of safety practices on the sites. So, normally at least weekly, and sometimes when we get high-risk construction work on site where we've got lots of plant, um, lots of uh, structural steel and the like, we'll probably do it two or three times a week. We'll actually walk around the site, and based on the site manager's knowledge of what everybody's doing, which is not everything, very much like Baeda, he'll identify if there's any breaches that he, can, he or she can find. And the responsibility then for the head contractor is to say to the person who's dealing with that particular area, okay, I know that the code in relation to this particular issue says this and you're not doing that, so I need you to fix it up. So that's what our head contractors will do. Subcontractors, and this is part three of section 19, and it's the same for us as well. So, subcontractors are also an employer or a person conducting a business or undertaking. They've got exactly the same legal obligations, and you can meet them by setting up that safety management system, in my view, if you do it reasonably well. You have to provide and maintain a work environment without risk to health and safety, but let's come down to E. The provision of adequate facilities for the welfare of, work of, of workers in carrying out their work or business or undertaking, taking, including ensuring access to those facilities. Facilities are things like toilets, lunch rooms, appropriate water, if that's... Often, again, that, with communication between subbies and the head contractor, often that's provided by a head contractor. So often you won't have to worry about it. If you're on your own, you will. You do have to provide appropriate toilet facilities, wash facilities, etc. And it's always been a requirement, but with the new laws, it's become more loudly stated because they've actually developed a full code of practice on the provision of appropriate facilities. Provision of any information, training, instruction or supervision that is necessary to protect all persons from risks to their health and safety arising out of the work carried out as part of the conduct of the business. So, in your area of work, if a plumber on a large construction site is working in X area over in the corner of the site, they're responsible for making sure, or the owner of the business is making sure that those who are working there are appropriately supervised, appropriately trained, and especially, for example, if you've got apprentices on site. They have to be supervised fairly closely. Once again, um, if you've got an appropriate training and induction process in your safety management system, you should be meeting F. And then finally, the health of workers and the conditions of the workplace are monitored, so that's your safety inspections. So as I've said, the roles of the head contractor versus the, the subcontractor are slightly different. The, the head contractor has a, a, an overall responsibility of the site, but the head, but subcontractors have the same responsibilities in their little area of work that they're managing. And I lost my thing. And that's all I have, unless you'd like to make comment, ask questions, disagree with me. In, in regard to the work of the safety management system of subcontractors, how often would you recommend that the head contractor check that the work of the safety management system of subcontractors is start beforehand? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, in the forest industry, Ted, we did it at, before we, we um, um, employed them in the first place, and then we did regular audits, and I think that still happens, um, regular audits perhaps once per annum uh, to see if they'd implemented. In the construction industry, that doesn't happen at the moment. Um, but I think it's, it's not a bad uh, question to ask, and I think, I think it's more an issue of resourcing to be able to actually do that, have people who can audit a safety management system and then be able to actually have the time to do it.
Oh, b before I go, um, if you, there is some help, I did forget this. We do have these over there. In relation to some of the safety management system components, WorkSafe, yes, I think that my understanding, this has been um, authored by Steve Collins from the north of the state, but it does give you guidance on safety management systems and some basic templates that you can use to meet some of those safety management system requirements, including things like safety inspections, etc. So I think they are, they are available over here on the table, if anybody on wants... Well. Oh, on the tables as well. So please utilise the resources that are available. Thanks, Pat.